know who my wife is. And I like it too. So I wake up at 4 o'clock before the store. I may just wake her up and we'll go right around here. Amen. <laughs> oh, you know that. You know that. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you, you're so gracious and so kind and so loving and so merciful to us. And we thank you and we praise you for that, Father. We have come tonight to worship you and to honor you, Father, to study your word that you might enlighten us and inspire us, Father. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ in, in the middle of the week, Father, to just come together with one desire, and that is, Father, to be in your presence and to honor you. Father, we have mentioned so many names tonight, and Father, there's so many more that need to be lifted up that we don't even know about. But we're thankful, Father, that uh, you're an omniscient God. You know each and every person. You know each and every situation. And Father, not only are you omniscient, but you're on death. I'm not present. Father, you're with each and every one of those needs tonight. And oh, thank you, God, for the power of healing that you have placed in medicine, in the hands of doctors. And then, Father, when you see fit, just through your Holy Spirit, Father, in the body to work those miracles. The Father, we're thankful for, for one great gift that you showed to, the, to all of us, and that is your grace. Your grace is sufficient, no matter what might be the outcome of our situation. Father, you said you'd never leave us nor forsake us. If we'll look to you, and if we'll allow you to be our comforter. And, oh, God, we ask that you bless the offering tonight that's going to be received. Thank you for those who are so faithful to the financial ministry of this church. And, Father, may they be blessed. And, Father, may we be good stewards of that which they entrust to us. Now, Father, as we receive the offering, may you be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Greater blessing waits me. 
preacher a lot of times. I've been working on a passage of Scripture out of the life of Moses. Moses had been called by God. He had an awesome task to deal with the people that had been in bondage, and to bring them out of bondage. They were gripers and grumblers. And one day he went up and got the law of God and brought it back down. And when he came back down, they had totally apostated themselves and turned their back on God build a golden cave and he was worshiping a false god and he threw the, the tablets down and broke the law and went back up on the mountain to see God. And what I've been working on on the light of all of that is when he got back up there, Moses in all of his desperation, he said, Lord, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. I like that song. Amen. I didn't see when he went up. Praise God because of what He's done in my life. I will see Him when He comes back because I'm going to be a part of it. Amen. Amen. I'm going to either be here seeing Him come back or I'm going to be with Him coming back. Amen. Praise God. All right. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would please, to the book of Revelation once again. Revelation chapter 8. The study of those are now the vestibule. This Connie and some others have finally convinced me to let y'all have your study notes while we go through them, because there are people who says they like to make notes on their notes, and so uh, we'll do that, okay? And uh, we'll see how this goes. But we're going to start tonight looking at Revelation chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, and for the next few weeks we're going to go all the way through uh, to Revelation chapter 9 and verse 21. Uh, we're going to start tonight at the sixth trumpet judgments, although we won't get to any of those judgments tonight. Uh, but we will uh, before we get through with this whole text. When the Lamb of God opened the seventh seal, which was also the very last seal on that little scroll, that little book that was presented to us back there in the first part of the book of Revelation, we uh, understood that what he was opening was literally the title of deed to the earth. He was opening and taking claim because he was the only one worthy to open those seals to take claim once again of that which he is his creation. Now this scroll or this little book is first mentioned all the way back in chapter 5 and verse 1. And it takes place and brings our attention to judgments that will take place on what period of time is known as the day of the Lord. And as those judgments are, be, uh, are beginning to be unfolded and poured out upon mankind, we've already seen some of those judgments take place. As a matter of fact, I seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, there were judgments that fell on, on mankind and on the earth. Uh, we have noticed that these judgments, as each one comes, each one intensifies. It gets bigger, it expands even more dramatically. And so that's uh, important for us to understand because what we see in the fifth seal is bad, but in the sixth seal it gets worse. And then as we come on into the uh, trumpets, you're going to see that each one of the trumpets is going to intensify. And then when we get through the trumpets and we go into the bold judgments, you're going to see that the intensity of that gets even greater. So that's something to, uh, to be aware of. This final seal, though, this seventh seal, contains within it all of the remaining judgments that God will pour out uh, during the time of great tribulation. And uh, uh, as I've already said, this includes uh, what's going to take place in the uh, first six seals, then the uh, trumpet uh, judgments, and then the bowl judgments. Uh, some believe that the events uh, of the trumpet and of the, uh, the bowl judgments uh, happen at the very same time. But that's not true. That's just, uh, that's just not true. Uh, they're, they're better understood as a, as a telescope is made. Uh, you know how a telescope works? Uh, uh, the old ones. So go back to the pirate days. I was watching George Washington yesterday and he said, give me my spy glass. And they look about that long. But in order to see far off, then what do they do? They telescope it out, isn't that right? And that's the way these judgments are. Uh, as you pull it, it gets a little longer. 
As she pulled it, it gets a little longer. As she pulled it, it gets a little longer. And that's the way the trumpet judge was talking. The first one, uh, God pours out his wrath in that first one. Then as he brings the second trumpet, it gets a little stronger. And so on. And that's the way it'll be. So it's not the, the bold judgments and the, and the trumpet judgments are not taking place all at one time. Okay? Uh, the, the, seven, the seventh seal uh, that we are dealing with mainly, which is being opened right now, that brings about the, the bold judgments and the trumpet judgments, contains, as I've already mentioned, the seven trumpet uh, judgments. And it seems very clear that since there is no description of judgment in the seventh seal, and the seventh seal doesn't bring a judgment, it presents the, the trumpet judgments. Okay? And as we look at that, there is an anticipation that comes about because we see that there is judgment to follow, severe judgment that will follow, and will take place immediately in the text uh, as you look and deal with these seven trumpet uh, judgments in the Word of God. In like manner, the seventh trumpet does not describe the judgment as seen in chapters 10, uh, verse 7, and chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. Only information, but no judgment again takes place in the seventh trumpet judgment. It introduces really the mold judgments, okay? And also, we see that uh, it. Uh, just brings this anticipation and a heavenly rejoicing over the fact that God's getting ready to bring judgment. Now that may sound hard, but my friends will tell you something. It will be a glorious day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and finally God is recognized as God. You hear me? He has given ample time. He has given ample opportunity for man to get over himself and for man to realize that we are the creation of a divine, righteous, holy God and that he is worthy of our uh, allegiance, he is worthy of our worship, he is worthy of our dedication. But time and time again, man has done nothing but spit in the very face of Almighty God. Uh, there, there's a verse of scripture that I read often at the funeral as a matter of fact, I, I dealt with that passage of Scripture at, at Brother Mary's funeral just uh, uh, this past Sunday. And it's over in the book of Psalms where it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the dead of one of His saints. And my friends, that, that, that's a lot of statement whenever God looks at the death of a Christian man or a Christian woman. And to God, that is a precious thing. It is a dear thing. It is an honorable thing. And when we look at it now, now we 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 cry. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. But we we think it's such a tragedy, such a loss. Well, I will tell you something. When God sees a man or a woman who's truly washed in the blood, who's a part of the family of God, and they end their life in this world, He knows that that one's coming to Him to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And He knows that that one that's coming to Him is one who didn't spit on the blood of Jesus Christ who didn't spit on the cross, who didn't spit on what His precious Son laid down for us, but received what Jesus did. And so therefore, God sees that as a dear and precious thing because their battle is over with in this world and they're finally coming to their great reward we will feel. Amen. And so these here also will be anticipating and there will be heaven and rejoicing over the fact that judgment is to come. The progressive judgments within the seventh seal will take place over an, an indefinite period of time. Uh, the, the effects of the fifth trumpet, for example, will last for five months, as told in, in chapter 9, verse 10, uh, a period of time that is designated. And then the exact timetable for the trumpet and bold judgment is not revealed. Their escalating devastation indicates that they will occur during the last half of the tribulation, which is known as the Great Tribulation. The seventh seal encompasses all of God's final wrath upon the return of His Son Jesus Christ and His return to receive uh, with His bride this world once again. So tonight we're going to look at the opening 
of the Sabbath seat. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 8. And we're going to deal with them verse by verse. The first thing that is brought to our attention as we look at verse 1 of chapter 8 is there is a time of silence. Whenever the seventh seal is open, there is a time of silence. It says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. A little leeway there. Could have been uh, 31 minutes. Could have been 29 minutes. We don't know. But somewhere around the space of half an hour. When Jesus broke the seventh seal, there's a very unique response that takes place. And that response is simply what? Silence. I mean all, everything, it was completely dead still. I believe that the silence is so great. Have you ever heard the term, it got so quiet that you could even hear a pin drop? Mm -hmm. I believe that's just how quiet everything got. Uh, a review of the visions up to this very point makes it clear that John had heard a great deal of noise in heaven, had he not? We've seen that time and time again. If you go back to Revelation chapter 4, it says that he witnessed the sounds and the, and the visions of lightning and thunders and voices that emanated from the throne of Almighty God. And that's found in Revelation 4 verse 5. And then also we find out that the four beasts and they that rest, that they rest not day and night, they were hollering and, and rejoicing loudly, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty which was, which is, and which is to come. We find that down in verse 8. They're worshiping and praising Almighty God. And then later, John, we're told in chapter 5 and verse 2, that John heard a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. That the cries of the martyrs, those who were, were put to death during the tribulation time and the great tribulation time up to that point, uh, were crying out for vengeance. We see that over in chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. And the loud, loud, loud roar of a powerful earthquake also was heard. This also heard in chapter 6, and verse 12. And then an angel, there in chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, it says that there was an angel who cried with a loud voice, saying, Heard not the earth, heard not neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So after all of this loudness that he has heard in, in his many different visions already, when the judgments become visible on the scroll, both the redeemed and the angels, the loudness is gone. They are reduced. Everybody is reduced to nothing but silence. And as that takes place, they face the reality of the future destruction that is written and that's going to take place. And they do so with a silence of apprehension. And literally, they stand in absolute awe of what God is about to do. You hear me? It's probably going to be hard as it was for John. For John to even imagine what God is about to, to do, what is about to take place. While eternal heaven really has no timetable with it whatsoever. Uh, up in heaven, uh, we don't have to worry about this morning. I had to go to the doctor over in Florence. My appointment was 8.45. I normally get up every morning right around 7 o'clock. But for some reason this morning, Connie woke up before I did. And the way I tell, I can't see the clock. I'm so blind, I can't see the clock without my glasses. But I look at the room, and if it's pretty light, I know it's a little bit after 7. So I look over the clock, do this number trying to make out if it's seven, how far past seven. Because she keeps the clock in our bedroom at least ten minutes ahead of regular time. So if it's seven ten, I know it's dead seven o'clock. Well I for some reason I went back to sleep and she patted me. She said, Honey, I hate to wake you up, but you gotta be at the doctor at 845. And so I got up. We're on the time table, are we not? Well thank God when we finally get to heaven, you can throw your time at this way. Amen. You don't have to worry about setting the alarm clock before you go to bed of the night. Uh, so in the eternal heaven, there is no time. The apostle John, who is seeing the vision, uh, does uh, apprehend time, though, okay? And each minute of that half hour 
Somebody said a little bit ago, asked a little bit ago, how do you know it's half hour? Well, the Bible says so. Somewhere around half hour, okay? It's not my prediction. It's not my prophecy. It's God's. And whatever minute it was, do you realize how long each one of those minutes must have been to John? As he anticipated what God's next move was going to be. What God's next action is going to be. I'm sure that each minute probably felt like an hour within itself. Heaven, which had resounded with loud praises from the vast crowds of people and the angels because it uh, became automatically just very strangely still and silent. And the greatest event since the fall of, uh, 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 of mankind is about to take place. You hear me? The greatest event since that time is about to take place. God is about to show vengeance like he's never shown before. So that brings us down to verse number two, what I would call the seventh. Look at verse number two. It said, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Following this half hour of silence there in heaven, John now experiences the vision of seven angels coming. And not only are they just made visible to him, but they're made visible to him standing before the very throne of Almighty God. The word that is used there in that verse, the little three-letter word, the, appears in a way that it sets these angels apart as a very unique group. The uh, seven angels, which uh, some have called the present angels. The present angels. And I really should have underlined that very phrase because many theologians use that phrase about these seven angels. And the reason for that is is because the Greek verb that is translated there, stood or standing, whichever your Bible says, indicates that these angels were in the very presence of God and it wasn't just something that they showed up for at this particular time, but they had been standing in the presence of God and been there for some time, some very long period of time. Scripture describes various ranks and different orders of angels. On Sunday night, if you're not involved with Awana, if you're not involved with the choir, if you're not involved with uh, some other program in the church, we're studying right now on Sunday nights uh, about the angels. We've been doing so for the last couple of Sunday nights. Come and be with us because the Word of God teaches us that there are different orders and there are different ranks of angels. Uh, there are angels that are known as cherubims. You'll find them in Genesis 3, verse 24. There's angels that are known as seraphims. You'll find them mentioned over in Isaiah chapter 6, and verse 2. you also know that the Bible talks to us about archangels. They're mentioned in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, and then again in Jude chapter 9. And it talks not only about these these type of angels, but also it talks about thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities over in Colossians, and that's a make up of different angels also. Now some are good angels, and some are evil angels, because in that reference it also makes mention to us over in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we're wrestling against evil angels, and we're wrestling against Satan, you hear me? who has uh, oppressed, who has possessed human beings in this world. And they have now got their place in places of authority within our government, within our homes, within our churches, within our business world. And, and their, their intentions are evil. Their intentions are wicked. They're out to please man and not God. You hear me? And so that is all a part of that. Now these seven uh, angels appear to be uh, one such uh, of an order of high-ranking angels. We're not told if they're cherubim or seraphims. We just we're told that they must be of a special order themselves because they're mentioned in this way. As a matter of fact, Gabriel may have been one of them, and we know that because of his own description of himself. If you look there where you notes I gave you in Luke chapter one verse nineteen. It is Gabriel who said, and I underline this for you, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. You hear what I say? He said, I'm Gabriel. And my duty is I stand in the presence of God. And that's what we've been told about the seven angels 
also, and Gabriel might have been one of these. We're not given his name. As John watched, he saw that they were given trumpets. Each, uh, each one of the seven angels received a trumpet. And they were given that trumpet in preparation for the trumpet judgments that was going to shortly begin to take place that would follow. As they did in the seal judgments, and as they also will in the bold judgments that will come later, the angels are participating in the trumpet judgments. The uh, involvement of these angels is very consistent with the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ because he tells us that angels will, will play a very important role in God's future judgments. And he describes this for us over in Matthew chapter 13 uh, and verses 39 through 41 and again in verses 49 through 50. He does so again in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27 and again in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31. I put those scriptures there for you so you can go home and read those scriptures and see where the Lord Jesus Christ has made these prophecies. Each of the seven trumpets that were blown by each of the seven uh, angels will unleash a, a very specific judgment. And as I've already said, each one will be of greater intensity than the first uh, six seals uh, that have already been unleashed. Yet, although they will intensify in, in their damage and in, in what God pours out upon this earth and mankind, they will not be as destructive as the seven bold judgments that are coming. After the seven trumpets, then the seven bold judgments. And there they will be even more intensified and even more devastating. And you'll see that later on down in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. The first four trumpets destroys the earth's ecology. And that's very important because the ecology of the earth, the world that we live in, uh, this uh, is the organisms and the environment in which. Uh, we live here. Uh, this is a very special planet. You hear me? And I told y'all time and time again, y'all know better than I do because some of y'all were better science uh, students than I was. But I want you to know something. What we see, we're just a little microcosm of what God's created. There, there is such a vast uh, creation out here, my friends, that man was the most powerful. Uh, viewing thing, the instruments that's never seen to the end of Jubilee. And in the midst of all of this, Earth is the only planet that is fit for human dwelling. Now, I reckon that just happened because Darwin knew it was going to, right? <laughs> no. God designed it that way. Isn't that right? He designed it every bit And I want you to know something. That whenever God begins to pour them out, his judgments through these trumpet and, and these bold judgments, that very ecology is going to be disturbed. Do you hear me? And what all that means, I don't know, Mike. But I know for a fact that's what the book tells us. Now, the next two trumpets that will blow by the next two angels will produce demonic destruction of humanity. Demons will be released upon mankind. Now this is seen over in chapter 8, verses 13, and also chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, and on down in verses 13 through 19. The seventh trumpet that will uh, be blown, will, uh, and the, the final trumpet that will be blown, uh, will introduce the final outpouring of God's wrath, contained not in a judgment itself on the trumpet, but it will unleash the bold judgment. Same thing with the seals. There were judgments in seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But when it had 6, but then when the seventh seal was broken, there wasn't a judgment. If you want to call it a judgment, the judgment was simply, it unleashed the trumpet judgments. Trumpet 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They all have a judgment that comes with them. When the seventh trumpet is blown, there won't be a judgment unless you want to say the judgment is and releases the bold judgment which will be even more intensified. Now, having been introduced and given their trumpets, the seven angels did not immediately blow them because they had to wait for other important events 
to take place. Okay? Now, look with me, if you would, at verses 3 and 4 of Revelation uh, chapter 8. And uh, let's look at the supplication. It says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the Lord. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. John's attention is immediately drawn from the seven angels themselves who are standing there with their seven trumpets. Each one will have their seven known trumpets. His attention is drawn from them and it comes to the altar of incense because another angel has now appeared. And this angel now comes up to the altar of incense and stands. I started to put a picture on the board. Uh, I know that you're familiar with the tabernacle and with the temple. Uh, whenever you come into, this just use the temple the tabernacle. When you come into the tabernacle, you have to come through the, the white linen curtain. There's only one door to come in, right? All of that's representative of Jesus. The, the, the wall, the curtain is so close to the ground that nobody can come under it. It's so high that nobody can climb over uh, Anyone that does that is a thief. But those who are of the family of God, they come in through the gate. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. Uh, as they come in, the first thing they come to is the altar of sacrifice, the brazen altar. And we must make sacrifice before we can go any further into the worship of God. So they make their sacrifice, and then as they leave there, they head to a tent dwelling. And as they head to the tent dwelling, the tent is made up of two rooms. And just outside of the uh, doorway to the entrance to those uh, two-room tents, there is a big bowl of water. And there they wash their hands and they wash their feet. It is a, a bowl that has been beaten and made into a bowl out of the mirrors, uh, the metal mirrors of the women of Israel. And it's a picture of the Word of God. When we look into the Word of God, what do we see when we look into the Word of God? It shows us ourselves. Is that right? Shows us our sin. Shows us our need for a Savior. Is that right? And what does it do when we obey the Word of God? The Word of God acts like a water. It washes our sins away. Amen? Brings us to the one who can cleanse us. So you have to wash yourself. And then as you go into the, the doorway of the first room of that two-room tent, you enter into the place that is known as the holy place. Okay? In the holy place, which is all of this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the Word. And as you go into that place, you, you come in contact with uh, on the, the left hand side and, and the inside of this is made uh, of walls covered in, in gold and so you don't have electricity in there but on the left hand side it is the menorah it's a seven pound candlestick which represents uh, God and man uh, man's number is represented by the six, the six prongs on each side of the main prong and Jesus is the seventh one. The oil is what feeds it. That's the Holy Spirit of God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And those that seven prong candlestick is lit up and that light reflects off of those golden panels within that room. And, and on the left hand side there, there is a table of showbread which the priests uh, take part in. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so therefore Jesus is represented there. And then you've got the bread, the showbread table here. You've got the menorah over here. And then as you head towards the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies, you come to a golden altar. And on that golden altar, every day, twice a day, the, the priest takes fire off of the brazen sacrificial altar out in the courtyard and brings it into the, the altar of incense and they keep the fire burning in there. And then the priest comes in with a, a, a bag of incense. And he puts the incense on that. And then a smoke rises up. And that smoke is representative of the prayers of the saints. And as he goes out of the building, there's a, a cloud that forms. And that's the Shekinah glory of God. And as long as that cloud's over, over the holy place, it tells the people, 
God's in their presence. Amen. Now this altar that we just got to, that's the altar we're looking at right here. It's the altar of incense. And it says that the, the altar is the altar of the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And this smoke is going up into the, the nostrils of Almighty God. Now some identify this angel as the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, but that's not the life of reality. Just this, because Christ is already identified in the heavenly scene as who? The Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Remember chapter 5? He's already been identified. And Jesus is nowhere identified as an angel in the New Testament. You'll never find that in the New Testament from Matthew all the way through the book of Revelation. He's never identified as an angel. He's not an angel. He's God. Amen? And then also, the angel in verse 3 is described as another of the same kind, like those in verse 2. He is of the same rank. He is of the same order as those seven. Not given a name, but that's the way he's identified within the Scripture. And everywhere Jesus appears in the book of Revelation, he is clearly identified as the Lamb, as the Son of God. Okay, so so this this angel that stands there before the altar of incense, I, I just don't think it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if he were the one at the altar, I believe that it would be reasonable to assume that he would be specifically identified. Don't you think so? I think so. I think that God would make it known to us. And then John notes that. Uh, there in, in the scriptures, that another angel came and stood at the altar. Uh, that altar is the, the heavenly counterpart to the altar of incense in the tabernacle of the temple, which I just described to you, which also was made with gold. And you'll find that over in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 3. It was the same golden uh, incense altar that was seen by another great man of God, a man by the name of Isaiah. In his vision, if you remember, over in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 6. And then also another great man by the name of Ezekiel. Amen? And he identifies that in Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 2. The further description of this altar as before the throne assures John's readers, the people that will be reading this revelation, that he is putting together under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that the altar of incense was earthly counterpart to this heavenly incense altar. Uh, that, that is very evident because the altar of incense in the tabernacle and in the temple was the nearest thing to the Holy of Holies where God's glory dwelt. Right there at the veil. Now what happened to the veil when Jesus hung on the cross and yielded up the Spirit? It was rented, tore in two. Now, now that veil was somewhere about that thick, okay? It would took several teams of mules, everybody to rip that thing. Man could rip that thing. And then what was so great about that, it was rented from what point to what point? Top to bottom. From top to bottom. That's right. It wasn't something that started at the foot. God ripped that thing. Amen. Consistent with that identification is that the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand, we're told in this passage of Scripture. And also, in the Old Testament, the priest, as I've already mentioned, you would twice daily take hot, fiery coals from the brazen altar and transport them to that holy place, to the altar of incense. The angel took the incense which symbolizes the multiplied prayers of God's people that was given to him. Now this, remember, this is documented for us earlier in the book of Revelation, chapter 5 and verse 8, and chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Now, now it does not tell us who gave the angel the incense. The verb that's used there is simply was given. And, and this verb was given frequently refers in the book of Revelation to something that was given by God. So, we would just take it out assuming that God gave him the incense. Amen. That God gave him the incense. Now, this was done so that the angel might be able to add to the prayers of all of the saints that had already risen from that altar. 
Those prayers were for Satan to be destroyed. Those prayers were for sin to be defeated. Those prayers were that their deaths, those martyrs, that their deaths would be avenged. Those prayers were for the Lord Jesus Christ to come as stated that over in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. And as the angel added his incense to that already burning altar, the smoke of that incense with the prayers of those saints went up before Almighty God out of the angel's hand. And these are most likely the cries of believers in that great tribulation time against their persecutors and against all of those who had blessed the Almighty God and the Lord Jesus Christ during and in that particular time. That brings us to our last verse for tonight, and that is verse 5, and it deals with the storm. It says, And the angel took the censer, and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. And there were voices, and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. The censer, filled with fire of the altar. Usually, that particular phrase right there links with the prayers of God's people, because here is a symbol of divine wrath. The, the angel's act of casting it to the earth. And that's what he did with it. See, he cast it to the earth. And that reveals that God's judgment will come in direct response to the prayers of his people. My friends, let me tell you something. If you have never grabbed hold of the reality of how important it is for us, the people of God, to be consistent in prayer, this will do, let you know. Pray for your lost loved ones. Pray for your sick ones. Pray for yourself. But you know one thing we should all be praying for? And then, my friends, this, this God's will is going to be done. His plans are going to be taking place in His own timetable. But the Word of God teaches us that we should daily, as the people of God, be praying for one thing. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some come into my office today and we were talking about different things. This political stuff's all over everywhere, you know. And a lot of people say, you know, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's just absolutely stupidity. The friends will tell you something. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. There, there's only one cure. There's only one cure. And I've got news for you. It's not an independent uh, politician. It's not a democratic politician. It's not a Republican politician. It's not capitalism. It's not socialism. It's not communism. It is Jesus. He's the only cure. You hear me? And my friends, I know it may sound awful for us to say, come Lord Jesus, because we've got people that need to be saved. I've got people that I want to see saved before it happens. And, and, and I assure you one thing. We need to be praying for it. And one day our prayers won't be answered. But God's not going to come until God's ready to come. Amen? And you know what's so tragic about it? So many of those that we would put him off and put him off and put him off for. If he was away another 10,000 years, they still wouldn't change their mind. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't change their heart. You hear me? How many times have I shared with you the reality that whenever Jesus comes back and sets up his thousand year reign, everybody that's in this world at that particular time, along with all of the saints, it says that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. But you know what? That doesn't mean that every person that bows the knee, every person that confesses is a part of the kingdom of God. Because after the thousand years, Satan is going to be released. That's what's taking place right here. Satan's going to be released. And you know what's going to take place when he's released? All of those who were just hypocrites are going to run right back to the devil again. You hear me? And a lot of those will be some of those that we are so concerned about. And that's why we need to make sure that we are diligent to witness to them and to give them the opportunity, every opportunity. But my friends, I don't know about you. I'm anxious to see Jesus come. Amen? Listen, the immediate effect of the firestorm of wrath that burst upon the earth. Our peals were told here in the scripture of thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes 
And this is in direct contrast to the silence that was noted in the beginning of chapter 8, verse 1. These peals of thunder and these sounds of, and splashes of lightning are associated with the, uh, the awesome majesty of God's glorious throne. And you can see that if you look over in Revelation and Exodus also. Now, no details are given about the earthquake, but it will probably be at least as powerful as the one that is associated with the sixth seal. And if you remember, I said when that earthquake takes place, that it is going to be so great that this whole skin of the planet Earth is going to shift and be here. You're going to shift and be. So that brings us to the end of our study for tonight. Next Wednesday night, we will begin to look at the trumpet judgments. The trumpet judgments. Now let me ask you something before we...